Hi, thank you so much for joining in this afternoon. Once again, my name is Shanessa. Um, so I'll just mention that this is a research, innovation, and commercialization project that connect stakeholders across the research and innovation value chain across Ghana. Um, this project is done in partnership with RISA and UK Aid. And then this is the virtual part of the capacity building phase of this project, which is designed to equip researchers and innovators with needed skills. So today's session is on fundraising for research and commercialization with Jesse. And this is going to be facilitated by Amalati. And I'll just do a quick introduction of who she is and then she'll take over. And so Amalate has a six, she has over 16 years of experience as a director in the social enterprise, impact investing and nonprofit sectors. She is skilled at strategy development and execution, building partnerships, advocacy, fundraising, and working with people and teams across cultures. And she has managed teams in Ghana, Ethiopia, Tanzania, Rwanda, Senegal, Chad, and DR um, Congo. She's a social entrepreneur with a passion for seeing young people acquire skills for success and helping organizations achieve more impact. She has co-founded co um, Social Enterprise Ghana, an organization building a thriving social enterprise sector in Ghana through training, impact funds, research, and advocacy. She is also a fellow of the fifth class of the African Leadership Initiative. West Africa and a member of the Aspen Global Leadership Network. Amalate, if you are on the floor, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. It's such a great pleasure to be here and to um, to be able to share with um, everyone we have on the line. We started uh, with a little bit of a poll and it would be great to see the poll results. And whilst we're doing that, you can put in the chat your name and your organization and whether you are a researcher or you are um, on the business side um, already commercializing uh, an, uh, an invention. I see someone said they could not get sound. Um, do put in the chat again if you are not able to get the sound. So um, can we can we have can we end the poll and show the results? Okay, great. Okay, so I think you can all see the results. This is just to give us a sense of who's on the call, and um, and so we have about twenty seven percent of you, the biggest group here. You don't have an invention, you don't have a business, but you want to learn about research commercialization. You are in a good place because we will talk about um, research commercialization. Um, then we have the next group. I don't have an invention, but I have a business I want to grow. So I'll talk a little bit about growing your business. Um, we'll start off talking about research commercialization since that is what the bulk of the and presentation was on, and then we will talk about growing your business in general. But 27% of you um, have an invention and you've set up a company or you're partnering with a company to commercialize it. So you're also in the right place because we will talk about how do you go ahead to take your innovation or invention and commercialize it. So, um, Thank you for, for, for sharing who you are in the room. And um, we look forward to a very interactive session. I'm going to share my screen. Um, great. We just did the poll. So we're going to talk about research commercialization and why you should integrate Jesse. We'll talk about who funds research commercialization and suggest a process for your fundraising. 
And then we'll talk about fundraising from angel investors and venture capital and fundraising from foundations and international development agencies, because that's a little different. And then because we have so many entrepreneurs who want to grow their business, if we have time at the end, we'll talk about growing your business, building a business that is attractive to investors. So we'll jump right in. Um, and I want to start off with a question. So let's just imagine that somebody's written you a $1 million check. And they say that you can keep it if you can successfully invest it in a company. So just see yourself holding that check, or maybe they sent it into your bank account, $1 million, But the contract says you can only keep it if you can successfully invest it in a company. The question is, how would you go about selecting which company to invest in? What kind of company would you not invest in? And what kind of companies would you invest in? And it'll be great to hear from some of the people on the line. I can see in the chat that we have quite a diverse group. Um, I can see some good friends. Um, I see Kelvin from Heal the World, Odelia, uh, one good friend from um, Oxford, Africa Women's Initiative, Perby Onassis, and there are quite a few of you on the line. So any of you can unmute or, or lift up your hand and share. How would you go about selecting this company? One million is yours if you can successfully um, invest it. Well, this is Odilia. So um, I will select um, companies that don't have sin at, um, as attached to their businesses. So for example, I wouldn't invest in alcohol companies. Mm. Um, I won't invest in cocaine ridden companies. <laughs> so um, companies that um, have to pay sin tax, I will not invest in them. And then um, I would like to invest in um, social enterprises mm. um, because I run a social enterprise myself, so I will be social enterprise by us. I would like to invest in tech companies because I think that the future is techy, and um, and therefore I'd like to invest in companies like that. And then the first question is, how would you go about selecting? Well, I'd like not to just look at their numbers, but I'd like to look at their impact. So these are the two places I'll be looking at, impact and then numbers. Because sometimes people can have fantastic numbers, but they actually are just making money for themselves and not making impact. And so these are the two things I would look at. Thank you, Odelia. There are many investors that think like you in, in the world, so... We have the Odelia investors who um, care about impact, um, but they also don't want to lose their money and they don't want to pay sin tax um, by investing in places where there's more risk because of the kind of business. Anybody else wants to share? You have $1 million to invest. You get to keep it if you can successfully invest it, meaning you invest and make a profit. Sorry, I think I should have clarified. You can keep it if you invest to make a profit. Um, who who would you invest in? Any others? Right, hello, good afternoon. So good, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, right, Gerald. Don't... Please go ahead. So, given one million dollars, okay, I would invest in agriculture because I believe so tomorrow, once human beings would have the need to eat, there would always be the market for agriculture. And the way I would plan to invest it would be looking at um, the supply chain and also providing logistics. So there are going to be various, um, let's say, points of investment from the farmers to the extension officers to service providers, the water holes, the fertilizers. So let's say the fertilizers, the seeds, all those people, there's going to be a different investment, a sub investment for them, the farmers as well, the extension officers, veterinary officers. There's also a sub investment for them. Now there's been um an investment of logistics and export. 
right from the farm to the local market, meat picking from Ghana to the market, and also production and manufacturing for concern for the Ghana market and also for raw material ports and also push factored materials also. So there are going to be various forms and various models of investing in the agriculture. And as a block of power, uh, we will block it. Most of the infrastructure is also going to be into the act. Okay, investment is going to be a lot of data and people who are going to um, be working on the data and the research team for areas uh, you need them and also for the brain developers as well. Because I would like uh, the, um, where the, we to cut the losses, right? To track every transaction, production. So I would migrate it onto the blocks to get it. Instead of the traditional account holding data science and all stuff, at any point in I like to just log in, look at it the blockchain. So with the $1 million, it's going to be a whole lot that I would dive into. Thank you. Thank you, Gerald, for sharing that. So very techy, but also you want to get your money back using technology to drive scale, to help you monitor, et cetera. So um, anybody else wants to go? I see in the chat, um, Gameli um, says that he would invest in the biotech sector. Um, thank you for sharing that. Um, so we can see from what has been shared that the moment you're giving a pot of money to invest, you begin to think about um, where you can get the, the best return. And for some investors like Odilia, you also want impact. You begin to think, where is it? Can I, you know, um, Gerald spoke about export and um, places where you can be guaranteed a certain kind of return. So with that in our minds, with ourselves sitting in the shoes of the investor, an investor who wants to make money, um, let's talk a little bit about research commercialization. This was a very interesting topic. It was fundraising for research commercialization and gender and social inclusion. So I'll start by talking about research commercialization and why you should in integrate gender and social integration and a little bit about how, and then we'll jump into the actual, how do you fundraise? We'll talk a little bit about your emotional um, relationship with money, which is a strong barrier or enabler for all entrepreneurs, businesses, projects as they go on their fundraising journey. So there are many definitions for research commercialization. It's the process of turning the results of a research, which could be a product or a service or a process into a profitable commercial venture. Usually you are taking that technology from your lab or from your research and development department into an existing company, assuming it's an existing company that's innovating or the innovators are setting up the innovators have an existing company, and sometimes it's a new company. Um, you are um, creating a new company. It can be an existing company. Sometimes you're selling the technology to someone else. And so if you can take the results of the research and turn it into a profitable venture, then you've commercialized that research. Now, gender and social equity is the other term in this topic. And I thought... Um, of this visual. It's a visual that some of you may be familiar with that really illustrates what we mean by gender equality and gender equity. Gender equality says that women and men should have equal rights, opportunities, and respect. And gender equity says that men, women, girls, boys have different needs and so to be fair to them, we need to deal with each person according to their need so they can realize that equal opportunity, right, and respect. So in this photo, gender equity, when done well, will result in gender equality. So you can see um, 
three people looking over the fence trying to enjoy a sports game. There's a taller person and then someone who's a little shorter and someone who's really shorter. Now, if we set equality in the way we treat them, then we give everybody the same height of stand, which means my dear Mr. Short doesn't get to see at all. And then two of them get to see, but one person is way over the fence. Um, if we distribute the, um, the standing uh, boxes in an equitable way, then everybody gets to see. Everybody has an equal opportunity to enjoy the sports match. And so gender equity says that we have different needs. And so we may need um, different resources, different opportunities to be able to get to the point where there's true equality. So where you have equity, that is true equality, where we have the equal opportunities. Um, when you are distributing resources in a way that is equal to people who are not equal in their needs, what you have at the end of the day is not equality and you still have someone who is disadvantaged or left behind. So I thought this was a really interesting visual to share and in the q and it would be great to hear your reflections on it. Social inclusion is a similar context, but rather than talking about um, gender as a way by which a person may be vulnerable, it, it, it broadens it to other groups. So it's talking about including um, women and girls because women and girls tend not to be included. Not always. There are times when boys are not included and need to be included also. Um, and so it's really about vulnerable groups, groups that are at risk of exclusion within a particular context. So it's context specific. In the context of your business, it may be women and girls. It may be young people who are excluded. It may be older people who are excluded, who are not able to participate, or people living with disabilities. And this may be in the design of the product or in the way it's used. It's a useful product that whole community could benefit from. And people living with disabilities are happy to pay for it and use it, but they are not able to. So for example, in Ghana, if you are, um, there's only one bank that allows blind people to stamp their signature and use a checkbook. Um, or stamp their signature and be able to access a service, which means that they must always be assisted by someone else and that will limit the ability to enjoy financial services. And so you can, you know, um, um, the bank that uh, does that um, has um, considered that there are people with disabilities, including those who are visually impaired in our community and have created in their policy a way to enable those people to access financial services independently. And there may be other ways that different businesses can explore and understand who is at risk of being excluded from your products or services and, um, and then design a way to include them so they can also participate in society and um, have equal opportunities, equal um, joy. Now, it's good to do this because it creates a better world, but it also makes business sense, especially in, in, in our part of the world, and um, because you can attract impact investors when you, um, when you have a clear story you can, those things can lead you to better innovation and um, it can help you have a competitive advantage um, over your stakeholders. And many times uh, products or service that include a feature that is inclusive um, are able to um, find out that other people who are not vulnerable appreciate the feature and it becomes a place of competitive advantage. And a case in point, one pharmaceutical company in Ghana um, uh, got approached by a health facility and um, because this was um, in the 80s, 90s, because children struggled to take malaria tablets and they used their own resources to create a sweeter dispersable tablet. This was a small project that they were doing as part of their community service. And um, that project led to being awarded a contract to deliver malaria tablets for a large scale program and eventually sort of shifted the market for um, children um, and malaria uh, medicine for children. 
Um, for those of you who are as old as me, you remember chloroquine and all the other awful medicines that um, we, we had to take as children. And now the landscape for um, giving children uh, a malaria medicine has changed drastically. And so one company um, seeking to um, um, do something to include children, to give them and uh, make it easier for their mothers to give them medicine, give them better health, ends up developing a market stream becomes a market leader and gains new markets. And um, there's a, a logo you can see, Ushahidi. It's a tech um, platform that was developed in Kenya when Kenya had election violence and um, the very first time that it happened. And it was used for mapping where the violence was. Um, it was set up as a community project, but it, it turned into a very commercial um, uh, um, uh, uh, product that was that has used all over the world, including in the USA. It was used by Obama for America. It was used during some um, tornadoes and um, hurricanes in the US, and it's been used all over the world and has become a sustainable product that is is um, has brought its founders and its creators a lot of value both financial value as well as satisfaction in seeing all the saved lives that have come from this, this platform that was for mapping, started off as mapping where violence is, is happening um, so that there could be intervention. And then it ended up now as a mapping technology for any crisis um, that, that can um, mobilize resources to support. So you can see from these practical examples that there is some advantage in considering inclusion, whether it's gender inclusion or broader social inclusion in your company. Increasingly, um, it, it, it's helping to do things like manage your risk um, um, because as the world changes and your suppliers and your customers, if they are companies, may require you to um, adhere to certain global or national policies, et cetera. The more you engage with your stakeholders and understand the impact you have on them, and um, the more you understand your risk and are able to manage them. And it can even bring opportunities for reducing your costs, improving your financial performance, building more loyal customers. Um, employees that work in companies that are caring tend to um, stay longer, tend to be more engaged, more productive um, employees. And, um, and, and then there's the ultimate of creating a better world. So these are all reasons why you should consider, just consider the question. You, you are going through a research and development process anyway. You are talking to customers anyway. It's just making sure that some of the customers you're talking to are coming from vulnerable groups so that you can bring in those perspectives in the work you're doing. So it, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be a separate line of action. It is integrating these, this thinking in what you do every day so that even though it may come at a cost, it's not a cost that will be too high. So how do you do this? Um, first is identifying which stakeholders or vulnerable groups are impacted by your innovation either because they are your customers, they are your suppliers, or they are just in the community around um, where you live. They could be potential or actual um, 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 stakeholders. And consider how they may face barriers in accessing and using your innovation. Or sometimes they can use it, but the quality of service they receive is poor. Uh, there are times when your product or service or innovation may have a negative impact on a vulnerable group. And it's good to consider that. And then to design safeguards to ensure that vulnerable groups can access and use your innovation and that they receive a, a pretty decent quality of service. And when you document that, that these are the groups, this is, these are the barriers they face, and this is how I'm addressing it, then that will be a gender and social inclusion strategy. And if you can measure the, the, the activities you're doing, the results and the progress, then you can communicate that progress and begin to unlock some of the impact that we talked about in the previous slide. There are tools that can help you in a structured way along this process. I've highlighted one, which is the SDG Impact Standards for Enterprises. And because it's free, it's open source, it's simple, it walks you through a simple process um, for uh, in, in integrating uh, sustainability and impact into your business. 
So I'll pause now and take any reflections or comments from the audience. So I see for my previous question, Ethel um, mentioned that I will invest in agro-processing, specifically eggs processing. I have a feeling people are investing in the businesses they're actually doing, which is great because you understand that business and you believe it has a, um, a, 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 a strong viability, commercial viability. Um, but if not, um, yes, egg production is an egg shortage um, currently. Um, but challenges with uh, um, accessing raw materials and, and other things. And um, some strategic investments could yield to really great um, returns there. Any questions on gender and social equality before we jump into your emotional relationship with money? Okay, then we will move on um, to your emotional relationship with money. It's a really interesting subject to put into a webinar on commercialization of research. Hello. The way, yes, is that a question? Yeah, I have a question. Yes, please go ahead. Now, if, if we do the gender inclusion analysis, and it brings up additional costs that you cannot afford. What we should do? What should we do? You, you start with what you can do. You document that this is the case. You start with what you can do. It's better that you know that here are the challenges. A lot depends on what the issue are, issues are. If you have a negative impact on vulnerable groups, that happens even if those groups are not accessing a product or service. Let's say you're polluting or something like that. Then you need to deal with it no matter the cost because you are not adding value to, to the world and it will come back as a risk to bite you. So then you it becomes an innovation challenge. How do I deal with this um, at this cost, which I can afford? And that is where research comes in. That is where you can either explore what others have done or begin to innovate yourself to be able to do it at the cost you can afford um, because it's a negative impact and you cannot ignore it. If it is a positive impact that you want to add, you begin to document, this is how I want to do it. You begin to find prototypes. So you may not have solved the problem in a way that is integrated in your product or service, but you're testing a few things in ways that you can um, you can afford. And that is how the pharmaceutical company went about it. They began to experiment in their lab and test things out with a specific health facility on a small scale in a way they could afford. And once they could do it and could get the regulatory approval, that took a little bit of time. And then it's, then they could supply it to this healthcare facility. So because they didn't have a lot of resources, they were not able to roll it out as a big project. But over time, um, once they had the results of that and uh, the, the strong recommendations, it moved on. So don't look at it as an all or nothing thing. I must have this big bulk of money or else I cannot take this move. Ask yourself, what's the, the next step I can take? And the next and the next. And sometimes the path will unfold over time. It may take a little longer, but you will get there once you start the journey. Does that answer your question? Okay, hello. Yes. Yes, the follow-up question. Okay, one follow-up question. Um, please. Follow-up question. Now, now in food, in food uh, processing, in food processing, if we say you are putting in place quality management system, we have a company that makes sure like Ghana Standard and FDA. Yes. So this, Jesse, thing, do we have organization policing it? So I wouldn't say policing. Making sure that we do include the gender and those things. Yes, I wouldn't say policing. I will say the SDG impact standards comes with an assurance framework. So you could pay and get an independent assurer to come and give you a seal and say that you comply. 
Also, some investors, and we'll go into that, require you to report on your environmental, social, and governance um, impacts before they will invest in you so they can understand the risk you come with. And there are third-party companies that do that kind of uh, assessment um, based on reports that you do for them. And sometimes they will come in and do an independent assessment. So there, it, there isn't a, a standards board on gender and social inclusion in Ghana, but there are these um, uh, um, uh, other standards and they are accredited trainers for the SDG impact standards in Ghana. We don't have an Ashura yet in Ghana, but we're working on, on getting one. Or, or getting some. Great. So thank you for that question. Um, okay, it's always thank you. To be able to um, to hear from you. So if you have any question, um, please jot it down so that when we pause for questions, you can jump, jump in with them. So your emotional relationship with money. If you've sat in any of my fundraising or entrepreneurship class, you may have gone through this and it's important because the way we think as humans and the way we we feel the strong emotions that drive us affects us subconsciously in many interesting ways including when we fundraise so let's take a, a, a moment and ask yourself a couple of these questions where do your money values come from is it from your parents from a mentor from friends how does money make, make you feel does it make you feel confident? Or some people feel insecure um, if they have too much money or the other way around. Um, what's the history of your relationship with money? Is your history that of making good financial decisions that turned out really well? And if so, why? And if not, why? When there are issues regarding money, do you take action quickly to deal with those issues or are you hesitant? Are you impulsive with money or do you have the discipline to say no, even though there's, if there's something that you feel like doing that has a money implication, but you, 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 your, your mind tells you this may not be best. Is it that you act immediately that's the impulsive um, or you think it through and can say no before the money is spent. And if you are a parent or a guardian, what are you passing on to the next generation? When you look at your children, do they have good values with money? And um, what are they inheriting from you? So this is a sensitive question to ask people to share on. So I, 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 I won't make it a compulsory question but we'll take a pause and if anyone wants to share, feel free to share. If you're not comfortable to share, that's all right also. Okay, silence means you're all in a reflective mood. So we'll leave you to ponder over the questions as we talk more about some money principles. So money is a tool. And like all tools, it can help you to accomplish a lot of good things, like build a business um, and commercialize a product for yourself, for the people you love and the things you find important, like your business. Now, it, because it's a tool, it can be managed and harnessed like any other tool. And you can also get better at it. You know, any tool that you pick in the world and you can increase your skill in using it. But money is interesting because it comes with many emotions that um, other tools may not always come with. And so it's important to understand your emotions so you can choose what you want your response to be and what you want your actions to be when it comes to money. One of the things to keep in mind is if we're to look at the resources on earth, there are enough for a decent life by all, and people can be happy. But money can be used to do evil things, but it's not evil. And if um, the fact that there are resources for abundant living doesn't mean that the world is infinite. The world is finite. And so we have limitations, limitations on the amount of time that we can invest 
in pursuing anything, including the pursuit of a profitable venture. And we have limits in terms of the natural resources available. The, the earth has a biological um, 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 you know, boundaries that cannot be exceeded. And so that abundant living is in the confines of those um, sort of boundaries. And so I want us to keep these money principles in mind. Um, and then some of these are things that you've probably had said, that money is important, that money is time. And so the way you spend your time also sort of ref can reflect the value you put on money. Um, money can sometimes feel like it, it's, it, it puts value on things because the things you want come at a cost. Um, the truth is that all these things we, we went over, I mean, other people may say all sorts of things about money, but what really matters is what you say. And very few of us sit down to articulate or to say to ourselves consciously, these things happen subconsciously, so we just act. But very few of us sit down to, to, to really break down what is going on in our minds. And I'll give you some example. I've, I've known people who always lose their money. Somehow they don't, they, they don't know what happened to their money. And so they will say, I don't know what happened to their money. It's all gone. And the truth is they don't know. They don't know, but the, the money did not walk out of their pocket. They spent every penny of it on something else. Now we all have different styles. You don't need to personally and um, write down every single thing necessarily to have a successful relationship with money. But you need to have a sense of control so that you generally know what you're doing, so that if what you're doing is not leading you to where you want to go, you can stop doing it. And so what you say are the things that you're telling yourself in your mind. And it's important that you understand that as an individual. If you're to summarize money, usually it's spending less, less than what you, 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 you earn as an individual. And I'm talking now in terms of the way you manage your personal finances, though it can be extrapolated to a business or to a country, except when you're in high growth phase where on a unit basis, you're making money, but maybe you are investing in the business. And so because you're investing, you're spending quite a lot compared to your revenue, but you can't do that forever. You do that for a season and then there's a season where you reap. It's like when you go to school, you're investing, you're not earning, and then a season comes where you reap. Um, but in general, um, outside those unique situations is spending less, investing in things that make more money, not things that take money away and understanding what's happening to your money so that you can make informed choices. And it's important that you're doing this as an individual and having a sense of control over money because it will make money conversations easy. It will be easy for you to ask people for money and for a lot of it because you're comfortable with it, because you're confident in it. It will be easy for you to think about money. It will be easy for you to deal with someone's skepticism if they are feeling um, that they, they are not confident in the way you, um, let's say, projections that you've put out. And it will make you more confident in explaining that, less emotional and less able to connect, understand what the objections are and be able to build and we'll talk about relationships and how important that is in fundraising. So we'll take a pause here before we go into the research commercialization uh, fundraising and begin to look at the different kinds of funders and how we can access them and take any questions or reflections on our emotional relationship with money. I'm taking it off share. This is a quiet group, as usually happens with online webinars. And I know sometimes people are at their desk at work, so it may be hard to unmute yourself. So you can also put in the chat 
if you have any reflections or questions or thoughts. Okay, it looks like we have silence. And so, um, Mr. Kosh Kwesi says, getting along nicely so far. So, no, no comments from him. Ethel, yeah. any reflections? Yeah. yeah, okay. So, um, I'm into egg processing. And for manufacturing companies, um, sometimes the capital is huge. So, anytime, um, I mean, reflecting on the emotions you have about money, anytime I'm talking about the the capital I need, personally, um, it, it sounds so huge to me. So it was not until I think last month I was, I was at the Women's Deliver Conference and I met one lady who was doing uh, proteins by fermentation. And she was like, um, so I raised $3 million for prototype. I was like, what? Three million dollars for prototype, and uh, and um, so I I think that at that moment I learned I I noticed that okay look, this money is not going into my pocket, this money is to drive a business. So uh, I because initially if not if I didn't meet that lady, uh, anyone else who asked me and I say oh I'm like oh i I think half a million will do. Without, I know what we really need, but then I'll, I'll, sh I'll shoot myself in the foot and say, have a million would do. So I think our emotions about money is really true. It's, um, um, as Africans, we are very modest about accent. And that was what I, I realized that we, 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 we think is huge, but then there are people who are raising 60 million to put up a factory. People are raising huge sums of money. So I think the emotions about money is really true. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that, Ethel. That's a really good example. And models can be effective ways of getting yourself unstuck. Um, if 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 you're fundraising and you feel like um uh, you 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 you're you're not getting a certain momentum, go talk to some successful people who fundraised and get inspired by their story and take that energy and realize that you have a business, you deserve to be able to fund it, you've put in great work and you've prepared um, and there is a funder that will see that. But when they see your hesitation, they also feel it. They feel your emotions and, and that makes them think, what is, what is this person not telling me? Why are they so hesitant, um, et cetera. Thank you, Ethel, for sharing that story. Um, I want to ask a question and uh, uh, my question is, is have you been able to find out what the gender emotion is towards money? Um, because my observation is that men have the tendency of boldly asking for big money, not necessarily having done um, the, the work mm -hmm. and not necessarily even knowing what um, that particular area they are going into business is about whilst on the and may have done the work they may have the figures but they are quite modern and i'll give a a personal um example um my husband started a construction business um his first degree is in social work he's never laid a block on a anything but he was able to raise money from two bankers to build two houses for them. I mean, if you ask me to do same with perhaps all my social capital, I, I perhaps won't find the boldness to do it. So in your presentation, I, I want to see how we as women um, in general, because there's data to back this, um, um, especially when it comes to the VC space, that... Um, women will not go into the space at all. Um, so if you are able to share with us as women what we can do um, to be able to talk these big figures and um, have access to them, I think it would be great. And 
for one of the things you spoke about um, in relation to how we were raised, um, who taught us money and how they are, they are, what they have taught us has impacted us. I think that it's a typical thing also coming from our cultural setting that men were supposed to carry money women were supposed to be in the kitchen. So I'm not too sure whether you have anything to say in relation to how we as women can boldly face um, the issues relating to money and ask, especially when we think we have the capabilities. Thank you, Odelia. And I think it applies to what, um, yes, you're right. Women um, tend to ask for less, even when they are they are very competent. And, and the way to deal with it is to recognize that and then to prepare and then to ask for more, to recognize that you are asking for less. Like Ethel said, she was she realized that she was hesitant in asking and she knew the amount she needed. She wasn't asking it. So when you recognize that, then it's a bit of self-work of sitting down with yourself and saying, next time I'm meeting a funder or even an acquaintance who asks, how much are you raising? I am going to say the full amount and I'm going to say it without hesitating. I will look them in the eye and I will expect that I will get a positive response. And so you psych yourself up before the meeting. You practice with a friend, with, with a partner, and you go in and you deliver. And it feels uncomfortable at the beginning, but as you practice, you get better at it. If you're on the other side where you tend to be, you know, let's go with the flow and, and let's do a deal that can work for certain amounts of money. But if you want investors that are serious, then you need to put in the time and understand your business. You need to put in the time and be prepared. And so if you're on the other side, then it's telling yourself that and forcing yourself to put together the preparation time so you can ask um, answer people's questions and actually make it through the first you know, family and friends kind of investments and actually get big investors to be interested in you. Does that answer your question, Odelia? Yes, it does. Practice, practice, practice. <laughs> yes. Go for it. You, you, you will, you will over over time, you, you will, you will stop feeling uncomfortable and you won't even know. Um and Gamali has put in the chat, what you're asking for should align with your needs. It may be that you don't need as much or as little as someone in another space. So skill set is also another factor. All very important points um, to make. And so understanding your emotional relationship with money, going prepared. So with that, let's jump into the how do you into the practicalities of how do you raise money? I see a diverse group on the line. I see some VC folks on the line. I see some um quite established businesses on the line. In um, in crafting this uh, webinar, I looked at you know the early registrations and they were mostly very small companies. And so I sort of skewed it to that. Now looking at the range, I will I will I'll see what I can do in the delivery to expand the, the range a little bit and to make sure that we have something for everyone. And feel free to chime in with questions if I am not uh, addressing your key concerns. So who funds research commercialization? So the first thing is you, your savings, that's bootstrapping. And um, if, if you have a product or service and you've developed an innovation, whether in the lab because you work in a university or um, you know, through your own experimentation and tinkering, or you're part of a research institution that's an applied research institution, and um, you can begin to fund that. It's called bootstrapping. Now, bootstrapping is easy because it's using resources you have, but it can be a slow way to grow because you're basically putting in money and turning it around and growing slowly. But what it can do for you is create some proof of concept that this can work and also show that you are committed. Um, I meet entrepreneurs many times who have an idea on paper, they have not put any money into and they want someone else to put money into right from the beginning. And that can be hard for someone else to do 
um, because you know they, they want to make a return and you are more risky when you have no experience. The next is family and friends. And usually people give money to those they trust. And so if you are known to be trustworthy in your circle, um, people may be willing to invest in your business. But if you're raising money from family and friends, don't treat it like family and friends. Approach them with the same professionalism that you would approach a regular commercial investor. Ensure that you document, you negotiate terms that are good for you and that you don't make too many concessions because this is your uncle and you think your uncle loves you or this is your cousin or this is your nephew or this is your best friend. Um, treat it commercial and negotiate uh, cutthroat uh, or negotiate in your own interest. Document it and try to stick to the, the terms of whatever investments they've made. And if something is going wrong, Keep them updated. Don't keep them in the dark. So, you know, you're supposed to um, pay back at a certain time or the invested equity, you're supposed to give them certain reports. You're having a difficult time until you disappear. Or else you may end up losing your family and friends. Um, and so now you have a struggling business and you don't have any family and friends to um, support you with the struggle. Um, then you can do, um, sometimes there are innovation competitions where you've, you've created something really innovative and especially if it has impact and um, you can apply for an innovation competition and if you win, um, there you go. But the, the pros, the cons is that you're competing with others and the decisions sometimes are made in a very short time um, with lengthy application forms, et cetera. And there are also incubators and accelerators. A good resource to know all the incubation and acceleration programs happening in Ghana is esoghana.org. ESO is Enterprise Support Organization, Ghana.org. It's a community platform that was built by a number of enterprise support organizations, including the Ghana Hub Network, NEIP, and others. And it lists all the various support programs happening. So it can be a good uh, place for you to go and check. Some of the incubators and acceleration programs come with funding, some don't. And so um, it, it may be a place to look at, especially if it is in the sector that your innovation is in. Then we have angel investors. These are individuals who have declared that they want to invest in small companies. And so they have a little bit of money or a lot um, that they are investing. And many times they will be focusing on a particular sector, et cetera. Angel investing is, a, is an emerging field in Ghana. I can see one angel investor on, in, the, in the group, but I won't mention his name since he didn't tell me that I should declare him as an angel investor. Um, and, um, and, and there are others. There are two angel networks um, that I'm aware of. They are Cry Angel Network and the Ladies Angel Network. That is a group of professional women that only invest in women-owned businesses. And, um, and um, there's also the Ghana Angel Investor Network, which is, has been revamped into an apex group for angel investors. So it will be rolling out training material for people who want to set up angel networks pull together money and invest in businesses in their network. And um, so you can go to an angel investor. Somebody may not declare themselves as an angel investor, but you know they are a wealthy individual and um, maybe a little removed, they are not your friend, but you believe that they understand your sector. And so you go to them with a business proposition. They are quite similar to venture capital firm. They said when it's a firm and not an individual, so most of the angels in Ghana that invest regularly, have family offices. They are wealthy individuals, so they have someone who's similar to a venture capital firm will review their investments, review your financials, and uh, tell the angel whether or not they think this is a good deal. Um, and so you need to approach it with the same level of professionalism again um, that you would venture capital. Venture capital funds are set up usually people who already have venture capital experience, so they worked in a fund or they worked in a company, funds invested in them, they sold the company, they have some cash now and they think, oh, I've, I have a lot of cash. Let me invest in similar companies. I can use my experience to help the company grow. And they take some of their own money and then they raise money from others. The others may be development financial institutions like 
British International Investments and Propaco and other institutions set up by governments to put money into things that have both impact and return. But they, they tend to look more, more the, the impact must be there, but they also look very much at the return. And they usually promise their investors, give us money. So say $25 million or $100 million. And we will invest it in 10 to 15 small companies. And we will deliver this return to you over 10 years. That will be higher than the return that you would get anywhere else. That portfolio of businesses, they really are looking for high growth businesses. And they know some of them may fail because high growth risk and return it may, means high risk. But some of them will do so well that they will make a lot of money. And so venture capital is something you should only consider if you are a high growth company. If you are a small community, sort of uh, community store, neighborhood store, neighborhood level business, you may not be a good um, fit for both venture capital and angel investing because they are looking to make such a big return that they will get their money back. Unless it's an angel investor who is more philanthropic, who is okay to get back with just a little return. So something comparable to what they would get if they invested, say, in government securities. Then you have grants, and a lot of businesses like grants because it's uh, it feels like free money. But people who give grants are looking for impact. And they also want to make sure that you don't take the money free. And so they will ask for you to report on the impact. And um, those reporting requirements can be quite detailed and they can sometimes feel like a distraction from your core business. And so keep that in mind. Some of the grant givers um, also care about um, the financial return. Um, and so they will be following that. They will be pushing you on that as well as pushing you on impact. And so it's good to understand foundations um, are usually set up as institutions to give grants. And international development agencies is foreign government money and it comes with specific rules. And so we'll go into a bit of details about how to access these. Another way to fund your research projects that not many people do is to form a strategic alliance, sometimes with a bigger company. So I have this innovation. You have done this company. Let's come together, use your factory and create the product. And, you know, we create a new brand and we share the proceeds or we create a new company and we share the proceeds. Joint ventures can be a very effective way of commercializing a project or a product or service where there is a, you know, you have a competing brand that could value that. Um, you have intellectual property or it's a little proprietary. So you can show them what it is, but they can't really replicate it without you having actually formed the joint venture with them. And so it gives you space to be able to negotiate and engage, form a joint venture if the person on the other side is willing. But remember, joint ventures are like marriage. So you really need to know and like the people you are doing this joint venture with, or else um, when things begin to go wrong, like in every marriage, there are days when you are not happy with a person. You want to have a certain value system set in place so that even when things um, don't go well, um, you, can, you can figure it out together. And you want to make sure that you are not very disadvantaged so that when things aren't going well, you are just kicked out and you have no recourse. If if that is 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 very likely, then maybe you are better off just selling the technology. And um, that's one way of commercializing. You sell the technology to the bigger firm, they pay you, you pocket your cash, and they go on and execute it, which can be a viable business. I was talking to an entrepreneur last week who had done a great business plan for a manufacturing plant and was struggling to raise money. And um, this entrepreneur said five years ago, Somebody approached her to purchase the business plan and the planning she had found. She had done a lot and the person valued that for $250,000. But she felt insulted by the offer because the person wanted to take 100% and so did not sell. Now about, um, actually it's eight years down the line. Business is still not set up. Um, so um, she's still a startup business still selling from her car. Never, the, thing, the thing never took off. So whilst 
sale of technology may seem like it's unfair to you, the question is, is the market ready? Is there a, a window? Are you the right CEO to lead this manufacturing company? Because it may be that your role is that of the innovator and that the sale of technology may be a good way that you can profit from that work you've done versus taking it to your grave where you are not able to turn it into a commercial venture um, and you're not able to sell. So in having that self-reflection to understand if it is you who's supposed to lead the company is, is another uh, is something you should do. Um, another business that uh, uh, um, is, uh, has, has, I've been associated with, the CEO or the, the gentleman who started the business went and recruited a senior person from an insurance company to come and be his CEO. So he's there as chief technology officer, but someone else runs his business. And they, they, they've they made it to the Ghana Club 100. This is a business that I saw start off from, you know, somebody come out of school and get, gain a little experience and set up a company. And so sometimes it's good to let go of a bit of control to gain a certain team that can actually take the building, uh, the, the the movement where it's supposed to be, either through a joint venture, sale of technology, um, building your team, um, et cetera. Let me pause here and take any reflections, and then we will begin to look at what funders are looking for and how you can prepare and position yourself, the fundraising process. Um, sorry, I'm a, I have a question, um, and this is not to um, preempt maybe what you're about to say in your other slides. Um, so if you find that you have a business that you want to sell off, ideally, what may be the first places to, to look out for buyers? Um, I know it's quite difficult for people wanting to sell off an idea that they perhaps have started just like the example you used exactly where are some of the places you quickly find look out for to find buyers for that particular project you have started so um if you, the first thing is to look at who will use that product or service who, who would value it so it's researching that um some of the things that i've seen so let's say you've developed a new product let's say it's a new drink or an, an, um, out of Something that is typically not um, done. I met an entrepreneur who had done an alcoholic beverage out of um, hibiscus flower. And it was a very unique taste, very unique flavor. And she wanted to enter a joint venture with an existing alcohol beverage company. And their alcohol beverage, so she approached them and said, here's the product. And um, she didn't tell them the production process, but here's the product and I want to have a joint venture. And they were initially happy. They had uh, discussions and then they wanted her to sell. She wasn't willing to, so she did not sell to them. So usually you look at who, who has a similar product where if, if they would value this and be willing to pay something for it. Um, um, another, I'm trying to think of other examples that I know. Um, so, so um sale. So um, venture capital, there are a few firms, a few venture capital firms that will purchase businesses where the founder is looking to retire. There's nobody else. They purchase a majority share to keep the business going. And then the founder who is getting old sort of now has an income, but they, they tend to want companies that have high revenues. So in their tens of millions of dollars. Um, there, so some venture capital firms will look at doing a majority stake in, in, a, in an existing business because they see that they can bring in a professional management team and take that business you know, 10, 20 times what it is, um, which allows this initial founder to retire. And there are a few firms that, that do that. Um, I would say it's all about relationships. Map out the industries that um, uh, um, uh, uh, um, could use that product or service and then be bold to go. This this lady who had the, the alcoholic beverage, she was a tiny 
company, barely started. And she just went straight to the company and said, this is what I have. And there was interest. So she went straight to the top and, and they had some good, though the deal did not close. And um, she, 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 she got close. It was a personal choice not to continue to close the deal. Um, and so I would say, go for it. List the companies, the best companies in your country, the best companies in the world and approach them and say, here's my product, here's my service. I think it'll be valuable to you. Are you interested in talking more? And it's a simple yes or no. If there's interest, then you continue it. It's, it can be helpful to have a transaction advisor along the journey when you are negotiating. Transaction advisory is not a well-developed industry in Ghana, but my other organization, Impact Investing Ghana, is together with BII, British International Investing, doing training for transaction advisors mm -hmm. and trying to grow that market so that we can have affordable transaction advisors for businesses to um, connect with. In fact, in other countries, they have companies who just have relationship with universities. You come up with your innovation and then they will go around and pitch it to all the companies and sell it for you because you are a researcher, you don't want to start a company. And so based on the criteria you give them, they go and sell it. And um, and and it's a, it's a setup and that's what they do. And because they do it every day, they gain network, they gain skills. And so um, it's also an area that we want to see develop in Ghana um, because then you, you can sell not just to companies in Ghana, but globally, um, if you have such supporting services in your market. Odilia, does that answer your question? Yes, it does, Anna, it does. Okay, great. Hi, Amma. Um, yes. I think there's a question in the chat box. Chat. Okay. Yeah. Let's How does fundraising chat. for physical products differ from knowledge Differ from products. knowledge products. So it's not significantly. Before you will fundraise, it's good to protect the product. So what am I going to be investing in? Um, if I'm investing in something that somebody can easily copy, then I may not be as confident to invest. So when you create a product or service, it's good to get a patent or um, trademark or acquire some intellectual property. You can do it for a physical product through having a process patent in terms of you, you trademark the process for creating the physical product. Um, you, you trademark the... Um, the 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 brand the you know you trademark all sorts of things so that now you can say here's my product and it's protected somebody can't just come and copy it and I know that um iSpace in this research and commercialization product a project has has other modules that is done on um on patenting and intellectual property etc correct me if I'm wrong um and and so you you may yes, be able to yes please I think that no, was Yes, that was the ahead. first seminar we had. Yeah, that was the first seminar we had. So yes, is the recording available we'll for people? Yeah, who we'll, want to we'll be sharing it. Yes. yes. So so the recording is available. Then there are other. I know uh, Mesty is setting up a a research commercialization center. There's one of our um uh, our, our collaborating organizations called Heritage Labs, which is developing uh blueprints that explains step by step how do you patent and um, and so um uh, you you we, we, all this will be shared i'm not quite sure what the url is for the heritage lab work if gamali is still on the call and and has that he could share so there are resources in ghana now and um, some of the universities are beginning to develop departments around um, research commercialization to support students and faculty that develop innovations to be able to sell. But it's an early stage and we want to see this market grow the way other markets have grown um, and, 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 and provide profitability. So these are all the ways, these are some ways you can fund your research commercialization. It's good to know what funders are looking for. And it came out in the intro question. If you were given for money, what were you looking for? Financial return, um, people invest because they want a return. And then impact, I think Odelia talks to, about the fact that she wants to invest in things that have impact. So some people like the venture capital, angel investors, et cetera, are looking for financial returns. 
Some like the grants are, are mostly looking for impact and a few are looking for both. And we call these impact investors and they cut across. They could be family and friends. They could be um, venture capital. They could be banks, etc. Banks are not ideal places for research commercialization because they fund things that have a, 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 a set cash flow. So you, you put collateral down, they give you money, they analyze what you're going to do with the money that some cash will come. But you are commercializing research you're in an early stage. You are now going to figure out if it will make money. And so the bank is not usually a good place to go to. It's a good place to go to where you have a project with a clear start and end, or you're funding your working capital or something that is very tangible that they can easily fund, some asset that um, you can turn. And there's a history of turning that asset to make cash. So let's talk about the fundraising process. So now you've decided I'm going to raise money. What do you do? And I want to suggest a four-step process to get the money and then two steps in managing it. First, you must identify prospective funders. Most of them will say no. So you need to identify a lot of them and make sure they are good fit for you. Most funders will tell you, we fund this range. If you are not looking for money within that range, you're not a good fit. We fund these countries. If your country is not mentioned, you are not a good fit. We fund these sectors. If the sector you are in is not there, you are not a good fit. So don't waste your time chasing 100 funders that you are not a good fit. Narrow down your list to the top 10, 15 that you are a good fit that you can do step three, build relationship with and get additional information. So this is when you become like James Bond. You need to understand the organization, not just what they have on their website, but build relationships. Now, people are very are not likely to give you money if the first thing you do is ask for money. But when you ask for advice, they, are they tend to give you. So you ask the organization for advice. You fund in my sector. I'm a business in this sector. Here are some products we're doing, and I would love to have the perspective of an, an, an investor. Can I have 30 minutes of your time to ask you some questions? And then you go prepared with questions to ask them. What are the trends that you're seeing? What do you think of this product, et cetera? And then you ask them, can I update you about my work? This is why I am, this is my revenue, et cetera. And then you ask them, do you fund people like me? And they may tell you, uh, now they've heard you. They've given you the advice. They may tell you, oh, yeah, you look interesting. But our fund just finished this version money. Right now we are managing the portfolio. But in a year, we would have fund, you know, they, that's when you get the inside scoop to get D, understand who they are, who makes the decision about the funding, what is the selection criteria, how much do they fund, and where exactly are they, do they really have money, or they are in a, you know, funds have cycles, there are times they have money, and there are times when they are managing the portfolio and exiting, but they may not have a, a, a portfolio that they are actively investing in at the time. So, um, Checking on LinkedIn, if anybody you know is connected to anybody at the company and asking them if they can introduce you for an informational um, interview may be good. Many times you may approach someone and they may not respond. It may not be because they don't want to meet you. It may be because they it was a busy time, the, the thing slips down their messages. And so sometimes a little bit of persistence to go back again and again may be useful or to try a different approach may be useful. But you can't do this for many companies that is why it's good to narrow down your list to a few that are a good fit so that when you are investing the relationship building time you know that it will bring some results because these are people in your sector i see a question um i think it was a hand up okay so gamali is answering the question about the standard operating procedures that will include um information on how to secure your intellectual property um, she, um, Gameli will share that since all of you attended this workshop done by iSpace, Gameli will make sure that iSpace receives those standard operating procedures and that is shared with all those who have attended these webinars. And there's an upcoming intellectual property workshop also. And so uh, Gameli will make sure that iSpace has that so that it can be shared with you. So those, some of you can attend that too. Thank you, Gameli. And I see iSpace has said thank you. So they will be um, following up with Gameli. Any questions at this point?
I advised an organization once where the executive director was applying for every proposal he could find, every call to action until the team was exhausted and they were not winning anything or, you know, they were just getting exhausted from the, so just focusing can help to retain your energy and really build your influence in the place where you are likely to win. So now that you have all this background information gained, not just through internet search, but through relationship, additional information. And this is important because look, if you have a pot of money that is finite and you are approached by a company, you've never heard of them before. You don't know any of the people and you are approached by a company where they've been talking to you for a month and you can see how they are growing. You can see that their team is growing. Who are you likely to invest in if the two companies are similar? You can unmute or put in the chat. Odilia, were you going to answer? No, I think you're just unmuted. Anna, please say that again. So I was asking if you are faced, if you are an investor, two similar companies, one of them is a, you don't know the team at all. On paper, they look interesting. Uh, they look good, but you don't know them personally. And then another company also looks good on paper, just like this other team. But that company has been communicating with you over two, three months, sending you updates about the challenges they are facing. You see the challenge, you see how they resolve it. Um, you know, once a month, they'll send you a quick update. This is, this, this is the progress we've made, et cetera. So you are beginning to get a feel for the company, et cetera. Of these two companies, which one are you likely to be more confident about investing in, if you can only invest in one? So Delia says relationship company. Godfrey says the second company. Which one is the second? I've forgotten the order I said it. <laughs> Ruth says I'll invest in the one I have rapport. Desmond said I'll invest in the one that's been updating me. And that's the same thing. The people you are collecting money from, they also have somebody they report to. And that person too is asking them, what's the impact of your money? What is So they are looking for things where they won't have stories to tell. And now their boss is upset with them because there's been a problem. And so they are looking to understand. They will do due diligence, but they will learn things about you over time that in a due diligence process where they are coming, interviewing you formally, you, you are there in your best behavior. Nobody in due diligence comes to behave badly. So the one that they've actually seen in real life they will be more confident about because they know this is not the polished, uh, um, this is not the polished Odelia or the polished Desmond or the polished Ruth. This is the real Ruth I'm meeting. So I know what I'm getting into and I know how to manage it. And also when I invest in them and I need updates to go and tell my board what's happening, they will give me updates because sometimes you invest in people and you don't hear from them. And you, it's only a board meeting you hear from them. And even then you are chasing them. They are not giving enough information, et cetera. So nobody wants to invest in somebody like that who keeps information to their chest and it's just difficult to work with. And so because they would have had investments like that where they struggled, when they meet someone who is not like that, it's like a breath of fresh air. It's, 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 it feels like, wow, this person understands how investors think that this is not free money. Me too, I have to go and report to somebody. And um, and uh, they, they feel more uh, attuned to you because you also understand them and you are behaving in a way that helps them to also shine in their job. So then depending on the kind of organization you apply, we'll talk about that in detail in the following slides. But after you apply, it's good to follow up. Sometimes you apply and your the answer is no follow up and ask, thank you for taking the time to review our application. Whilst we're disappointed that we were not selected, we want to learn from the experience. Can you give us 15 minutes of your time just to ask a few questions so that we can understand a little bit about how we can improve for next time with you or with other funders? And you'll be surprised, at least 50% of the people will give you their time. And 
it will help you understand how you can come and resell yourself to them and get a yes this time. So always follow up. Um, always follow up, even if you are disappointed. Disappointment is tough, especially if you've put in a lot of work. But um, follow up, ask questions. When somebody says we can't select you, ask them what were some of the challenges we had? Um, and then you understand, how could we fix, what could we do? We know that maybe you may not be interested, but what could we do to make ourselves more um, interesting to investors like you? Um, and they will give you information. You ask questions like that, that allow them to give you information. It's the same when you're building relationships. You ask them, what was, which investment are you most proud of? And what made it work? How did you make that selection? What did the person do? You know, so you are not asking, will you invest in me? Which is a hard question to answer. Nobody can tell you that because they have an investment committee. They have a board. They can't make a decision and make you a promise like that. But they can ask, answer questions about other investments they've done that can help you to understand them and position yourself better. And when you win, then you need to manage your investor because you will need more money. And it's easier to raise money from people who have given you money than from people who don't know you at all. So this means execute well, respect your contract. Challenges happen in life. If you have any challenge, you tell them immediately. One of the most difficult experiences I had was with this funder who had given us $3 million. And then uh, in the middle of the first year, they had even disbursed everything. Um, there was a regulatory challenge with the, which, which meant that it was this was it was a foundation, and we knew that in their home country that the regulatory challenge was such that it may affect their ability to give us money, and we debated whether we should tell them. But in the end, we told them, and we told them that we don't know the solution yet, but we are working on it. They were so helpful because the impact on them was going to be severe, and the problem solved with us. In the end, the solution we found was to return the money redo the application for them to give it back to us. And we could never have come with, to that solution by ourselves, but that was the only way. But it was in communicating with them, okay, we met with a regulator. This is what they said. We talked to a lawyer. This is what they said. And they'll tell us, that's very helpful. We actually have this challenge in other markets. So we are learning from you. And they became good friends over solving that challenge. We met with their board with their all senior levels that given the small, we were small grants for them. That was their average grant size was like 50 million. And so uh, ordinarily we would not have access to such senior levels, but because of this challenge, we built relationship. And even though it was difficult for about a year, every when once we sorted it out, execution was great and there were subsequent follow on um, investments made. Now it doesn't mean that it will always go well like that. But the principle is when you do the right thing, it always comes back to benefit you. So do communicate challenges, communicate them well. So communicate them that we've identified this challenge. We are working on it. We don't have a solution yet, but we are working on it. Don't say we have this challenge. We don't know what to do, full stop. You know, at least communicate the steps you are taking, what you know, and, and in a way that gives them confidence that you are doing your best. So that is what I will say on the process for fundraising. Um, I want to jump, I think we are almost at time, or if not over time. Um, oh no, we have, we are, we, are, we are ending on the hour. So we have 30 minutes. So um, let me take a pause because sometimes there are many questions around this, like how do I build, how do I find people, etc. cetera. Um, so any questions? Yes, please go ahead. Please, um, Monasis. Uh, I wanted to ask, what is the difference between raising funding for uh, fiscal products? Uh, maybe I'm not going to start the research before I innovate the prototype. But then the difference between that and just uh, a knowledge, knowledge based project. So, so could you give an example 
of a knowledge-based product? Okay, so knowledge-based products like uh, uh, a school, a school learning system, right? So okay. for a school learning system, maybe you identify problems in the structure. Got it. Got it. Got it. So thank you for asking that question. Um, the the uh, 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 so that's like a service. So um, apologies, I'm working from home. So from time to time, I have happy or unhappy children in the background. So that's an unhappy one. So um, um, when you're dealing with a service, it is not significantly different in the service. So if you have a physical product, you have this product, you're going to produce it. You have these customers, they are going to give you revenues and you do a financial model and you're going to investors that invest in that sector. If you have a service, it's a technology service. Again, you have this platform. So instead of a physical product, you have a platform. It is, you've, you've invested in service, you've invested in development, et cetera. And you've created this proprietary platform and you are now selling that. So it's not a physical product, but you're still selling it to customers. And so um, you, it's, 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 it's not too difficult. Basically, you say, this is, my, this is my customer. My customer is a private school. So the market is the market for private schools. This is the revenues. It's the same thing. It's just that um, it, it, the, the funder list may be different because you're looking for funders that are looking for technology services um, to, 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 to fund. Uh, but in terms of the process, it's, it's quite similar. It's quite similar. For the one with the physical product, you go to the person's office, you take a sample. For the person with the virtual product, you, um, you, you go and then you want to get them to log on and to try the experience so they see how good it is. Or you want to walk them through or you have an infographic video that walks you through you know, the service. So it's, it's not too difficult. It's not too different um, from, from a, a physical product, it's just that you present it a little differently. Does that answer your question or were you looking for more? I'm, I'm okay with that. Okay, great. I'm okay with that. Thank you, thank you. Desmond asked in the chat, how do you value your business so you do not ask for too little? Valuation is a very interesting thing. In the end, I've seen all sorts of valuations. It's about what you are willing to, to lose and what he or she is willing to pay for. And so the question is, how much money will you need? When you start raising money and giving percentages, especially if you do it from angels or venture, you will need more money. It's not, they have rounds of financing. So you start off with a little bit of money and it helps you to grow. Then you need more money to get to the next level, to get to the next level. So the business is big enough that it can, you know, give everybody their money back. So if you're giving a percentage away today, and then in two years, you give away more percentage, more percentage. And when other investors are in, they may be pushing for more investors to come in so that they can exit, for example. Or they may be wanting to invest more so they can have a bigger percentage. So don't just think in terms of what's the value of my business now. Model it out. How much money do I need to raise over the next 10 years to take the business to where it will be? when my investors are exiting, or maybe even I am exiting? And if so, what percentage will I be losing up to that point? And, um, and then give it a number, it's a negotiation. You can um, test it on a number of people within your market. And um, you can test it by looking at benchmarks. So there's a way of valuing where you look at similar companies and how much they were valued at, and you use that. But because we're in a market where a lot of companies are not raising equity and disclosing, you may not get a lot of benchmarks for your unique industry. You may need to look at benchmarks elsewhere, and then the investors will tell you it's a different market. But it's, it's, at least it's better than nothing. There are times also where you value all the things you've put in, your sweat equity, the time you've put in, and what you've been able to develop. If it is a... Um, if it is a knowledge product, like um, what uh, uh, I think it was Pebby who asked the question um, and mentioned, then it is all the money you've put into the development and you put a value to that platform 
um, and then you you have a number. But make sure that the percentage you lose over time, you end up with a percentage that's adequate. Just remember that it's it's better to be a, a, a part owner of a big profitable company than a big owner of a small loss-making company. And so don't be so hung on the percentages and um, just make sure that you are treating yourself fairly. And there are times when you can use other terms, not the percentage to deal with that. So for example, having a clause around um, voting rights so that founders have a certain voting right, even if their percentage goes down to a certain percent, which some business, some investors may or may not uh, agree to. But in the end, you should know that investors are looking out for their welfare. So don't make the mistake. I've seen quite a few businesses where, especially when the investors come as impact investors, impact investors doesn't mean they are good people. It just means they want impact. So don't think that because they are impact investors, you won't negotiate hard. You won't read the terms. Then somebody comes and takes over your company and you are crying, but you signed that they can replace you at any time. And you thought that these are kind people who are trying to help me, but they have also put money. They want their money back and they are not confident in you anymore. So they will say, we are just protecting our investment. And so you should, but you should ask yourself in such situations, are they right? Um, is there a way I can retain my share? Um, and if I'm not operating the company, but the company is going to be profitable and give me money, do I mind? And so these are tricky things, um, but you can also seek help from a professional um, to value your business. We are beginning a directory of transaction advisors on dealsourceafrica.co. I don't think it's up now. And um, some of these transaction advisors can, uh, can help you uh, value your company. But again, it's their opinion, their professional opinion. At the bottom line is what are you willing to lose? Um, and what is the other person willing to pay for? Um, how do you see this business? Is this your one business for life? You know, you're passionate about, you're married to, or it's one of many businesses. This is the one you're using to learn, um, et cetera. So think about yourself, your values, um, and then decide what it is you're willing to lose and how much you're willing to put in, how much you've put in so far um, so that um, you, you can be fair to yourself um, but fair to the investors also. So that's why I know it wasn't a clean answer. But I hope it gave you some perspectives. Okay, I, it did. Thank you, Desmond. And um, there was a question in the chat. Okay, that was the one in the chat. How do you value um, the the investment? So then let's move on to the. Yeah, I wanted to share Deal Source Africa. Okay, the transaction advisors page is there. What's on it? Okay, so the directory is not there yet. There's a link for transaction advisors to uh, um, to register. I think they are doing due diligence and then they will put the link. But dealsourceafrica.co is a service by Impact Investing Ghana to help businesses raise money, but only businesses that fit the criteria of the funds we have there are matched. So you can set up an account um, they will call you, they will look at you. If you don't match any of the business, the, the funds there, they will tell you, so we don't waste your time. Um, and then if you match, then they will help you prep a little bit and set up initial meetings. Sometimes we have deal rooms and sometimes we set up meetings in between the deal rooms. And they are, all the businesses need transaction advisors because the investors come back and say, we like you, give us uh, your financial model, give us your valuation, this. set up a data room. And then they need a transaction advisor to sit down and help them do it because you haven't done it before. And Google can only go so far. And so... Um, and you can also check that out for those of you that are very actively fundraising. So let me go back to my presentation. So we talked about the process for fundraising. Now let's go into fundraising from angels and venture capital. I put them together because they are sort of similar. And typically you would not go to them with a business plan. They want a pitch deck, which is a short slide that um, sort of explains who you are, your market, your financials. And let me say this, I've been in so many deal rooms. Most investors will go straight to the financial model. Most investors are not like Odilia. Odilia is looking for impact first. And then they will look at the financials later. 
most investors will just go straight to the financial model to see how the investment will lead to profitability. Most entrepreneurs spend hours beautifying their deck, the product, telling their story beautifully, and then they outsource the financial model to someone else. They don't understand it themselves. They don't get it double checked. And so they have a financial model that doesn't make sense. The financial model is just a profit and loss statement over time, usually, um, or it could be a full set of financial statements that shows here's the revenues coming. This is how it will grow over time. And with, with really sensible assumptions behind it, you are putting in this money and where will the market come from? And how can you show? What do you have? So for example, if you are an expert, there was a gentleman, I think it was Gerald, who was wanted to invest in agribusinesses that are doing export. If you go to a funder and you say, I have contacted three supermarkets in the EU and I have gotten off-taker agreements that they will take all my cut fruit or they will take this value of my cut fruit if I can produce cut fruit at this cost. So I have these agreements. So that's where the revenue is coming from. And these are assumptions. So the three agreements I have is year one. And I can tell because the market is like this across these countries that every year I can add this number of, of, of taker agreements and my, my, my revenue will grow. You put in this investment, this is how the return will come. It is clear and your assumptions are based on some reality because you've, not, you've gone beyond market research to approach potential customers to have some, like you're standing on solid ground. Your assumptions are not pie in the sky, picked up from your, your, your own, you know, you say that I am sure your surety when, when they are bored is asking them questions, they can't say the entrepreneur is sure they will have to bring the, the backing data to back those assumptions. So if your data is your confidence, then it may be a little difficult to explain or to, to have the investor be confident about your financial model. And it's good that you do that kind of background work in your financial model because you also want to make money for yourself. You, it's a business you may want impact, but you want money. So if there are any opportunities for you to make money, you want to do the research, make the calls, negotiate that off-take agreement, um, sell if it's a software, go and line up potential uh, um, buyers who say, if you give me, if you come to us with these um, details, uh, th this product at this price point will buy so that your assumptions are based on something. So these kinds of investors, they are looking for that your innovation has strong commercial potential. I'll talk about what that looks like. They want a, a good understanding that the market opportunity is good in a pitch deck. They want a clear financial model. And um, that is your, your basic financials with strong assumptions um, that show that their investments will lead to profitability and exponential return. Remember, I, I talked about the fact that um, it's important to, um, um, they want exponential return. And then they want a strong team with some track record. So even if you don't have track record in that specific business, you've brought it on in an advisory board. You are doing a software and you've brought on your advisory board the CEO who set up Space Phone and transitioned it to Ariba and whatever, who understands the market, is a member of your advisory board. Immediately they begin to see. So the team is not always necessarily the core team, but also the formal advisors that you've brought together. And whether it is a real advisory where you are meeting with them at least once a quarter, you are giving them structured reports, they are advising you and you are taking the advice. So if you have any documentation of those meetings, because you too, you take your advice seriously, you plan, you prepare for the meetings, you go there, you take the advice, et cetera, you document for you and the advisor. And so, you know, you, you have records, not just something you are saying. Um, that's those are all ways of es establishing track record um, 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 in, in your team. What makes a good market opportunity? You have an innovation. The custom, the market um, is large. There's a big market size um, and a met need. And the customer is easy for you to reach. Many people say, oh, it's middle-class Ghanaians and we'll meet them in social on social media. But you may be surprised that many of them are not clicking on social media ads for a new product that's very innovative unless they have a pain point that 
that product is meeting. So the investor knows this and will be asking themselves, is this a pain point that will make someone click? Won't they just, you know, I'm going to do online grocery shopping, um, but um, on online grocery shopping of non-perishables, but is the person's pain point for that big enough? Um, or maybe they will just cross the street to Auntie Mansa store shop and buy it at 50 pesos more. Um, I don't know. Uh, the investor would want to see proof. The product or service must meet the need. It must be easy to use and the benefit to the customer should be clear and simple. The competition should be limited and there should be high barriers to entry for others. So maybe you have a patent so they can't come and copy you or it takes a lot of cash to get in or you have a first mover advantage. And so even if somebody follows, everybody knows you, et cetera. And you can differentiate from the competition in some way, either through your brand or other way. If you don't need a lot of money, but the margin is good, that's why a lot of people like tech companies because many times they, they are low assets. It's like you're not buying lots of cars and things like that. So it feels like you can grow uh, um, very quickly. Um, and so sometimes people look at this, not always, every investor is different, but this is just one example of what makes a good market. So when we talk about strong commercial potential, we are talking about something with these characteristics. And so it's a need that many people have. Any, and also on the Deal Source Africa link, there's an e-learning. So there's a, I think there's a pitch deck example and, um, and um, there's an e-learning, there's a video on how to put together a good pitch deck. I'll see if I can link to that specific video um, in the chat. So any questions? So here's a link to the resources of the sample pitch deck. The sample pitch deck is very long, but your initial pitch deck should be quite short. It's long because I think the developers looked at different, different scenarios. So they have different slides for all the different things you could potentially put, but you want to have something short, like 10 slides. But to help the investor really understand, this is the problem I'm solving. This is the product and the solution. This is how big the market is. This is my team. And here are my financials and my plan. If this is how much money I'm looking for. And on a high level, how I will use it. So it's just telling that story very clearly so they can decide, do I want to meet this person? So the pitch deck will go to the investor before you. You send it in an email and say, here's my pitch deck. I'd love to have a meeting. And so you want them to scan that pitch deck and say, oh, this is interesting. I think I want to meet them. And so you, 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 it's not everything, it's just enough. Then you can have a, a second pitch deck that's more detailed that you now submit after they are interested in you, they want to make an investment, they have questions. Hey, looks like we have no questions on the equity. So we will move on to um, grant funding. Pull my slide back. So when fundraising for foundations, they are in the business of buying impact and bragging rights. A lot of the foundations, there are some that are corporate foundations like MasterCard. They are very professional teams. Then they want to show their board that we know how to identify impact early, invest in it, and then it turns to all this big impact. And there's a lot of egos involved when it is a, like I've gone and made my money. You know, I am the, I should, I guess I should, I should say it's more politically correct, but I am the, I don't want to mention any foundation name, um, big international foundation um, where I'm a founder, I made a lot of money and I, I now want to invest in impact I want to go in with the same kind of thing, give a small or medium-sized grant, and it turns into all this exponential impact. So you need to understand your impact. For international development, it may be a little more structured, but this is government money. I'll have to answer plenty questions. And so I don't want to give it to anybody who is not risky, and there are many rules around what you can spend. I want to make sure that there's no corruption, collusion, and so I'll be asking you for receipts. 
I'll be asking you for certain policies in place to protect others, et cetera, so that when my MPs call me and ask me uh, in my country how I'm spending the money, I can answer and say, here's all the things we've done. It's like managing your risk. So what do you need? You need to understand your impact. But because you are a business, you also need strong commercial potential because they are looking for financial sustainability. This time, it may not be a pitch deck. It may be a concept note, though for some funders, um, a grant funders, a pitch deck will do. And you still have the clear financial model showing how the grant money now, the money they will give you, will lead to profitability, exponential returns, which equals impact because your product or service has impact. And as you continue to grow it, more impact will come. And you still need a strong team with some track record, as well as strong policies in place. Policies are written documents that show the funder that this is how we deal with uh, discrimination. This is how we hire people, etc. So it's good to spend the time writing out some policies that they may want to check in due diligence. And at least once a year, you gather your team and you do a training so everybody understands the policy and is able to use it so you don't have your, your team members not applying the policy in their work. A concept note usually has, here's the problem in the world we are trying to solve. Here is the solution. And the solution is sort of the meat of it. Here's the product or service and how it addresses the problem. And these are the results. This is how we measure success. Because we measure success in, out, in, in, in impact, we need to be able to measure that. So for example, using the software company example, the problem we are trying to solve is that um, student learning Teachers are not able to get real-time analytical information about how students are doing to be able to take corrective action before um, exams. We have a technology solution that's easy to use that uh, teachers can enter in the daily progress of their, 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 their children. Parents will be updated so that if their child is having a problem, they can correct it. And parent, uh, ch parents, will, um, teachers will also see the trends so they can identify um, children that they may not have realized are beginning to slip early and take corrective action. That's an example of describing the results. So when you're going to the, the, the first one, the pitch deck, you may have an impact slide, but you're telling them schools are demanding school management systems because parents want more information. This is the market for private schools in Ghana. And here are the percentage of private schools we contacted that said that they want to purchase a school management system this year. You understand? So there may be that slight variation, but generally both are interested in both information. Then you also need to think about how you measure impact. So you may say that we'll measure impact in terms of the number of teachers on the platform actually uploading uh, information to parents at least once a week or something like that, because that's a number your platform will have anyway that you use to track and measure impact. And then you have a budget <coughs> for the specific grant, what you're going to use the grants for, as well as the financial projections similar to the, 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 for the, for the, um, um, the, the venture capital angel investors, et cetera. Now, um, it's good to be consistent. So if you say the problem is learning, my solution addresses learning. One, learning, uh, the description of products. One, a feature that allows sign up on learning. How will we measure impact? We will measure learning. It's good. And your budget, budget line one, learning platform. So when the person is reading your thing, they can see clearly the problem, that there's a problem, your solution addresses it, how you measure the impact, the budget. So you don't have a budget line where you, 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 you have all sorts of things they don't understand and that are very technical to you. So for example, you have a, a heading learning. Under that, you can have learning software, developer, et cetera, but it's all under the heading of that activity learning so that when they read your thing, the logic flows through. So just be consistent in the way you write these concept notes so that it's very clear to everyone um, who is reading them. I will pause now and take any questions. I think we have three minutes more.
I wanted to share some databases you can begin to research um, funding opportunities. Um, one of them is grantmakers.io. It shows funding opportunities, foundations in the US. You can check those who um, fund uh, internationally. Um, some of them may even specify the country um, and see for that. Then uh, if you're a nonprofit, you can do funds for NGOs because some nonprofits have a commercial product. And so the entity is a nonprofit, but um, uh, um, the, the, the product is commercial. And so you are using, so for example, World Vision International owns the Vision Fund, which is a microfinance institution. And it may raise grants money sometimes because it's a nonprofit. So that's another one. And um, there were a few others. I had a slide I'd listed, but I couldn't find it in another presentation. So these are two from the top of my head. Then uh, the people in your top list, they are websites, you want to check it out. Um, you want to check out, if you are looking for grant funding, you can check out UN emb agencies, embassies, international development, you can list them and just check them periodically. Um, but if you've I highlighted the top 15, that are a good fit. You also be working on the relationship building um, for that. So any questions? We have one minute. If not, I will hand over back to the iSpace team to wrap up. Over to you. All too soon, we've come to the end. Uh, thank you so much, Omar, for sharing this. I don't know if anybody has a question, you can put it in the chat box or you can raise your hand. Whilst we do that, I would like us to also put, uh, we can type our feedbacks in the chat box. We want to see how much this has helped you and can you put in one or two words in the, in the chat box? Yes, yeah, so I see somebody asking if we are going to have the recording of this section. So we are going to gather the recordings and the presentation slides right from the first session we had on intellectual property to this one. There are about six of them. So we'll be sharing that with you um, either tomorrow or in, a, in the coming days. So we'll have all of them. We'll have all of them shared with you. Yes, please. And so we'll do that. I'd just like to use this opportunity to thank you all for joining. We just want to do this quickly. We want I would be glad if we can all put on our videos because we want to take a quick picture. So I'd like to see the beautiful faces of all those behind here. Oh, yeah. Just a second, please. Papa, if you are on, we would like to say that we are ready.
Okay, so um, in a count of three, I'd like to, I'd like all of us to um, smile. On count one, two, and three. All right. Thank you so much for joining. Um, this is the end of the virtual phases of our. Uh, program and um, there will be panel sessions in October and so we'll be sharing information on how that's going to be it's obviously going to be virtual also and so I'll be sharing that information with us since I have I have all of um, I have everybody's email and their num and your numbers so I'll be sharing that information with you and I'd like to say thank you once again for joining and I'll share the um, information the recording and the slides and thank you, Alma, for bringing us this information. Have a good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye. 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 Thank you.